Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're still here. And so we go on with our study in Philippians. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I stand in Thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful that such a privilege is ours. I ask that the Holy Spirit just take charge of this time, that He would just strip away that which is error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. Father, we long to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. May we learn the worth, the greatness, and the power and majesty of our God. May we rejoice in His majesty and our blessed hope. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We are going through Philippians verse by verse, and in our last study together we were uh, somewhere in the area of verses uh, 6 and 7 of chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Now, before we look into this study, uh, there are many areas where people reach conclusions about Christ, which would in fact destroy the very fabric or the very foundation of truth, and it doesn't seem to bother them. We desperately want Jesus Christ to be something like us. You know, the Lord God declared of Israel that one of the great arguments that he had against them was that they, they considered him to be altogether like unto themselves. And there are many cases where uh, people can reach conclusions about a, a particular verse of Scripture which seem ap apparent uh, from that verse and yet yet would in fact destroy the majesty and the power and the glory of Jesus Christ. More than that, I, I believe it would destroy the very framework of our Christian faith. I mean, here was the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. You know, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And without argument, the popular approach to that single verse without, without any other comparison of Scripture with Scripture is to, is to conclude that the Lord Jesus Christ in His humanity shrunk from the very thing that He came to do. Folks, Christ did not primarily come to do anything but to die. He came primarily to die. He was born to die. It, it wasn't his primary function to fulfill the law or to perform miracles, though he did. You know, as important as those things were, but he came to die. And so many people, uh, especially nowadays, you know, see him in the garden facing the anguish of that cross, of that death, and yet shrinking from it. You know, when the very goal of His becoming flesh and dwelling among us was to give Himself in our place and and so I get, you know, and now so many want to see Him saying, Father, I don't want to go through with this, but nevertheless, Thy will be done. And in that, we are we're to see a great example that it wasn't what he wanted, but, but it was what the Father wanted. It's not really what he wanted, but it's what the Father wanted, and he knew that that's what the Father wanted. And, and now we have a, a huge theological problem. Dearly beloved, his request was, was, could not have been contrary to the will of God. I have scripture which says that if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it in order that the Father be glorified in the Son. And, and from that, uh, well, it, it just, it, does, it doesn't seem to be anything other than just a natural extension to suggest that if I ask anything that will not glorify the Father and the Son, I have in fact uh, well, I've, I've done something or said something that is contrary to the very will of God. The very fact that the Son would ask such a question as that is, is an indication that, that He and His Father are not 
one. If, if Christ asked any question that was not God's will, then he wasn't God. Okay, and the entire framework of what you believe collapses. If Christ is not God, you're not redeemed, and you are of, of all men most to be pitied. You have no blessed hope, okay? In having him ask a question or, or pray a, a prayer which is contrary to the will of God immediately says that he's not God. And if he's not God, then I don't have anything to preach. We know from Scripture, we know that Jesus wept. He wept at Lazarus' death when he was there to raise him. Not because Lazarus was dead and he was sorry about it but because of the unbelief and the lack of understanding of the people that he sweat drops of blood in the garden and he, and he prayed with strong crying and tears, Father, if it be possible, deliver me from this death and he was heard and that he rose from the dead. Absolutely nothing contrary to the will of God in the prayer of Christ. He, was, he wasn't asking that he be delivered from the cross, but that he be delivered from death. And his resurrection from the dead is the testimony. And we destroy the, the, ver the very foundation of Christianity when we suggest that Christ prayed a prayer contrary to the will of God. You know, and in, in the same way, we can destroy what we believe if we if we insidiously assume that the cross killed Christ. If you, dearly beloved, listen to me, if you do not implicitly believe, absolutely believe that Christ, if you do not believe that he could still be on that cross today after 2,000 years without a drop of water or, or a parcel of food and still be alive, then you don't understand the truth of this book. If the cross killed Christ, he's not God and you're not redeemed. If the Romans killed Christ, he's not God. If the Jews killed Christ, He's not God. If the Romans killed Christ, he's not God. If the Jews killed Christ, he's not God. But if he gave himself, which is the testimony of this book, you know, he bowed his head and he dismissed his spirit. Your belief system then is, is aligned with the truth of this book. Our Lord Jesus Christ was and is immortal if you don't understand the immortality of the lord jesus christ you have a you you've got a small comprehension of your redemption if you do not understand the immortality of the lord jesus christ you don't understand the context of our present study where we are here in philippians christ did not see corruption he wasn't killed by any human agency he gave himself for you and me. And to try to, to blow it up so that you can really visualize it, I'm going to suggest that had he not dismissed his spirit, he'd still be on that cross, alive, still breathing, today, without a drop of water or a parcel of food. Today. And if you don't believe that, then you have very little comprehension of the magnitude of what Christ did for you on that cross. When God declares that he gave you eternal life, that's exactly what he did. Okay? You are immortal. You're, you are immortal because the immortal God-man, Jesus Christ, died in your place. I have the testimony of Scripture that he did not see corruption of any kind. He didn't see corruption while he was three days in the tomb. His body did not see corruption. Now, yours would have. 
You know, you're filled with it. You're filled with corruption. You know, you were the very first minute that you drew your first breath, and you will be till you draw your last. But Christ did not see corruption. So unlike us, which would, you know, if, you know, if we died, we would immediately begin to decay. No such characteristics in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. No such characteristics in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I, and I, and I suggest that goes both ways. That's that as far as his physical body is concerned, but moreover, in the body, the living organism, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, no decay. The body of Christ, the church. We have another passage of Scripture. He was tested in all points like as we are yet without sin. Tested. And the testing to which we are, are put is to not trust God. It's, it's one of my favorite topics. It's one of my favorite things to just sit and, and think about, just to meditate on. The fact that, that every single trial, every single test, every, th every single incident that, that the Lord allows into our lives is meant to, 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 to al allow us the opportunity to trust Him. The, the testing, our, it is our faith that's tested. Uh, I mean, that's where Christ was tempted in all points like as we are. The, the temptation, the test of Eve was to believe that God was not telling the truth. The test of Job was to trust God despite complete devastation. Christ was tempted. Christ was tempted to not trust God, the Father. That was where he was tested. That's where he was tempted, as we are tempted, not to trust God, the Father. Now, Satan might well use, oh, I don't know, you know, you name it. He might use carnality to test you. But your testing is in the spiritual realm. And it's always to not trust God, to not exercise faith in God. It's wrong to say that God is putting a temptation in front of you to rob a bank. Okay, you know, and you really didn't want to do it, but the idiots left, they left a million bucks out on the table and the guard was asleep, you know, kind of like on, uh, you know, the old man, the, the old guard on uh, uh, Andy Griffith, you know, he's, he's asleep, you know, his gun falls apart and stuff, you know, you know, it was your carnal lust and flesh, okay, that did that. You were drawn away of your own lust and then, and then tempted not to do what God desires most of you to do, which is to trust Him. You don't need a million dollars. If you don't have it, you don't need it. If, if you do have it, you needed it. I mean, it. Your Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If you belong to God, you have what you need. If you right now belong to Jesus Christ, you have everything you need. Hard to believe, isn't it? But it's true. Testing, folks, is always not to trust God. And Christ was tempted in all those points, just like we are. But in all of these cases, we see that there was nothing of the, the carnal nature of the flesh. The old man... Nothing of the old man in Christ. You know, he could not be touched by sin. We're looking at the sinless, incarnate Son of God in the flesh, trusting God, trusting the Father. Scripturally, the carnal old man was not part and parcel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was born without sin. He was sinless. And now we come to our present text, okay, which is what we'll be discussing here in this video.
Folks, I think it goes without saying that we who profess to know Jesus Christ, we should very zealously guard the deity, the majesty, and the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't believe he ceased to be deity when he became incarnate in human flesh. If we speak of the incarnation separate from the deity, I have a huge problem. I don't believe the scriptures allow us to do that. Our very text says, who being in the form of God, the form of God, form being a, a, a really a form is a special word in the Greek that strongly suggests, it strongly says, always was and still is the essential essence of God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The majestic, eternal God. And most of us think of eternity as, as time. You know, time, especially uh, time on top of time. You know, and we can't do that. We have no right to do that. You know, there's, there's, there are two mathematical concepts that are very, very difficult to, to comprehend. I believe one is zero and the other is infinity. You know, to think of eternity as years piled on top of years, you know, I mean, you know, we have a hymn, you know, it's a beloved hymn. In fact, you know, you all know it. You know, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, you know, and so we have a hymn that's forcing us to think of eternity in terms of time. And please, folks, I'm not trying to be critical here. I love the hymn, Amazing Grace. But I, I can't help but, but, but just relay the fact of the matter to you that that's exactly what we, that hymn tends to do. We have a hymn that's, that's forcing us to think of eternity in, in terms of, of time. And that's not true. I'm of the mind for whatever it's worth, and I, you know, I've had uh, many of you disagree with me on this, but uh, that if any of you go to, if, if you were to go to be with the Lord today, I don't think any time at all would pass until, uh, if, I, I don't know how, I've said this so many times in so many videos, uh, well, maybe not a great number of videos, but I have I've absolutely made my made clear my position on this. I don't think any time at all will pass until the the, the people that you've left behind that their until their time ceases here and they go to be with you. I don't think any time will pass at all. Eternity has no place for time. Eternity is not an extension of time. Okay? That's not what eternity is. I believe the Jesus Christ that we're going to see in glory is what is there right now at the present time. The fullness of the deity settled down in the incarnation in bodily form. I believe that's the body that we're going to see. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the Son of Man comes down from heaven. So he was... So he was the son of man before he had a body. The son of man was in glory before he became a man. But it's the incarnate Christ that's, that is now in glory. And no man has seen God at any time. We know God is spirit. No man has seen God at any time. But we have seen Christ. We've seen Christ in the Word. It's the very essence, the very manifestation of God. That's, that, that is the revelation of God. That's what we're studying. I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ is Genesis through Revelation. And He's revealed in Scripture. That's where we see Christ. He, and He said, when you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. I believe that we're going to be uh, well, I, I don't know what Christian doesn't believe that, that we're going to be in bodily form. We're not just going to be a bunch of disembodied spirits running around heaven. You know, we are.
going to be in bodily form. We're, we're going to rise from the dead in bodily form. I believe we're going to dwell for all eternity in, in, a, in bodily form, you know, in bodies. And, and so uh, if, if you don't, the point I'm trying to make here, folks, is that if you don't believe God is immortal, okay, that Jesus Christ is immortal, then you and I are worlds apart. You know, we wouldn't last, I don't know how long we'd last, we wouldn't last very long without water. What, th what is it, three, four days, maybe? Christ was in the wilderness, folks, for 40 days without any water or any food. Okay, now surely that's a testimony to his immortality, his being God of very God. Now, we left the first chapter being told that God has given us something by grace. He's graciously granted us a couple of things here. First of all, he's given us belief that came by as a, it was a gracious gift from God. And secondly, suffering. And though it, it, it's, well, and we don't like to talk about that. You know, you can end you know, just about any dis discussion with another Christian fairly quick just talking about suffering. And, and you know, though it might be, I guess, uh, incomprehensible to us in, our, in our, our desire for all of those pretty little things in life, it is inconceivable to speak of faith and trust separate from suffering. If you did not have all those many things come your way to test the faith that God has granted you by grace, how could you say you trusted Him? Real trust is insepar it's inseparable from suffering. And I'm talking about suffering in the sense of mostly deprivation. Uh, you, you know, where you don't get your, whether it's something tangible, you don't get the, the new pickup that you wanted, or you don't, you don't get your way, you don't, you don't have your say in a matter. Uh, it's not the way that you would have had things go. You would, if you'd have had your druthers, you would have had this go another way, but God wanted it to go this way. We have... As I pointed out in my past video, we have the gracious opportunity to suffer on, on his behalf. Exactly what he told his disciples in John 15 and 16. You know, the world hates me. I'm going to dwell in you. The world then is going to hate you. Don't be surprised that that's true. It hates you because it hates me. And I have chosen you out of the world. You're not of the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. And if any one of you decided to go someplace and preach against adultery, you or you know, or or not robbing banks or whatever you you know is on that list of yours, you'll get a lot of hallelujahs and amens. But you tell somebody what God in Christ actually did for them in Jesus Christ that God did it, not themselves. You tell them that, folks, and they'll hate you. I remember early on in my Christian life, I'd only been a Christian for, I, I honestly, in all truth, I'd, I'd only been a Christian for several weeks. And I quickly learned what it meant to bear the offense of the cross because what I was preaching was not well received. That's not a message that people want to hear. And we've been given an opportunity to suffer on behalf of Christ. And I want to make sure that we understand that that suffering is not always having, you know, cancer or, 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 or being gunned down for our faith. You know, machine gunned for our faith. Or, you know, involved in some... Uh, environment where health and limb are at peril day after day. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not making light of those situations, folks. I'm not saying that's not suffering, but 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 that that suffering includes 
biblically, okay, it, it includes bearing the cross of Christ. And that is the testimony that God has completely done something for His own people in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to understand that. Why would the second chapter start out with, with exhortation and comfort and encouragement and compassion and, and, and pity and, and fellowship if life was to be a bowl of cherries, you know, you know once, once we came to know the Lord? Or, or if we were under law, in which case there is no law for such things as, as, as what we're looking at here. And, and we're now being asked to see that our minds, our attitude ought to be the same as the attitude, the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very profound passage of Scripture, folks. It almost defies, well, it, it does defy human understanding. It takes uh, a work of the Holy Spirit in, in enlightening us to understand the truth or the message that the Holy Spirit is, intends to convey here. This is a, this is a deep passage. So we, we, we begin verse 6. Who was, that is, always was, and always is in the form of God. Okay? This is what our text says. The outward evidence of the inward reality. We, we, we might translate the word. It was the outward manifestation of the inward reality, yet it, it was the display of His glory. Always having been the very essence of God. That he, did, he didn't consider that a thing to be zealously grasped or held on to. You know, to, to, to uh, display that essence, okay? And there are those who say that when He emptied Himself, verse 7, you know, He emptied Himself of His deity. And, and now he's, well, he's just a man, you know. There are others who say he emptied himself of some of, some of his attributes of deity, not all of them, but, but he, ma he maintained some aspects of his deity and, and he didn't exercise some aspects of his deity. Uh, there's some who say that. You know, he could heal and, and, and uh, uh, make the blind to see. He could perform miracles and so on. And then there, there are still others who say that when he emptied himself, he emptied himself of the use of his attributes. I, I've, I, I don't know if I mentioned in my previous video just where exactly I stood on that. Uh, but there are varied opinions on this, uh, on this emptying of himself. I think I mentioned in my last video uh, that I believe that the scriptures are saying without any argument that he emptied himself of the d display of his deity. Okay? He's God. We, c we can't make the Lord Jesus Christ any less than God. Uh, let's see. If... He, it, verse 7, it says he emptied himself. And I think that what he emptied himself of, if, if I haven't ruined the English grammar there, was the display of his deity. Those, those out there who believe that he emptied himself of, of his deity, those who believe that he emptied himself of a portion of his deity, and those who believe that he emptied himself of the use of his attributes or I believe those those ideas are all contrary to what the text is saying. I think there's a tremendous difference between use and display. Okay, he fed the five thousand, he gave sight to the blind, but I don't think that's display. I think if if he had fully displayed his deity, I don't believe that you you could have looked upon him. I don't believe that you could have looked upon the full display of his deity. Perhaps you couldn't have looked upon it and lived. I, I believe he used his attributes of deity. 
I believe we're dealing with a section of Scripture which is incomprehensible to the human mind. In, in the strictest sense, God of very God, God Himself, God of very God, died in my place, not just any death. He died a substitutionary death. Okay? If, and if we bring our, our own identification with Christ in alongside this mind of Christ that we're told to have, the same mind as He had, if, if we bring that, that factor into this, the fact that when He died, we died with Him, we were buried with Him, raised with Him. In fact, we, were, we are said to be co-seated with Him in the, in the heavenlies. If, if we take and bring that in alongside this passage here that we're looking at, uh, as you know, as it relates to to life springing forth out of death. I mean, you know, we were the life that sprang forth out of the death of Christ. We were that fruit. Okay. There's something very profound in the fact that our death to self, our bearing in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, this the, the bearing that same cross going through those same that same temptation daily those temptations those testings which test our faith which are meant to test our faith every single thing that happens to you folks in your life is meant to do one thing and that is allow you the opportunity to trust god not yourself but to trust god if we bring our, our identification with Christ in alongside this passage, we, we see something very, very, very profound taking place. We're told to, to be of the same mind. Let this mind be in you, the text says. Verses, verse, I believe that's verse 5. Verses 5. If we look at verses 5 through 8... Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a, of a, of a slave, the text says, and was made in the likeness of men. And, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, humbled himself even to the death of a cross. Uh, I think it's important to understand that we don't have a separate cross. It's not like, well, there's Steve's cross, and then there's, there's, there's Jeff's cross, and there's David's cross, and there's Larry's cross, and there's this, you know, there's Deborah's cross, and there's... That's not the cross we bear. The cross we bear is the cross of Christ. Let this mind be in you. Same mind, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Amazing, amazing passage of Scripture. He was so closely identified with the Father. He was so one with the Father. I, I, please, folks, don't miss, miss the picture here, okay? We're looking at a oneness, a unity. The, look, at the, look at the similarities, okay? The unity, the oneness that we have with Christ. That we've been made one with Christ. Just as Christ was one with the Father. Uh, he was, we're looking at the sinless Son of Man. Well, we have a sinless new nature. He lives within us. In a, in, we were made a new creation in Christ we're given a sinless new nature in which in which he, he abides he, he remains he continues with us in that sinless new nature we, he's been we've been united together with him in this new man what we call the new man the sinless new man look at the similarity there now if if 
if we have a sinless new nature that cannot sin because it's been born of God because his seed abides in us and we cannot sin if that's if that's how you want to interpret first John which I believe that's the way we're to take that then we're looking at something very profound here the the, the similarities only go so far but the similarities are astounding he willingly willingly chose to die okay but his cross is our cross and we were crucified with him and as a result of that humility as a result of that despising the shame as a result of him embracing that cross not shrinking back from it as many would suggest he did in the garden of gethsemane then all of a sudden we, we now see ourselves. We, we not only see the grand majesty and deity of Jesus Christ, the power, the all-consuming uh, power uh, of the Almighty God in this passage, but we see something very dynamic going on. We are being asked to have the same mind. Let this, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Same mind. Same mind. D the question, folks, I'm trying to drive at here is, are we, should we, are we being asked, is the text d expecting a, of us, expecting us to look at our walk, our life, our relationship with Christ, look at, is it to be guided by those that same principle of death to self? It's it's uh, you know I I don't know how much I've really talked about that subject of of death to self in in, in these videos. I'm we're, we're coming up now on the anniversary I think the fifth anniversary of Blessed Hope Forever. Uh, I've done a lot of videos. I don't know exactly how many, but I know that I've done many videos where that I've talked about our identification with Christ in his de death, burial, and resurrection. Folks, can, can we just first of all agree, okay, that we are talking about things here that are, are timeless, and we're we're talking about things here that are supernatural. Um, I'm just I'm I'm persuaded. I'm I'm of the mind that far too many Christians today look at these passages of Scripture, and they'll they'll look at this one particular passage here. Okay. Uh, particularly verses five through eight okay let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal to god but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant uh and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death even the death of the cross uh and i can just hear christians today reading this and saying to themselves as they read through this uh well that's pretty much stating the obvious we're just looking at another passage of scripture where that christ died on the cross nothing really profound to see here except that that that, that christ was just obedient to the death of the cross. Let this mind be in you. How easy do you think, folks, that, that, it, that it is? That, or that it would be? How, how, how easy do you think that, it, that it, it is for us to have that same mind as Christ had when he was facing the cross? I mean... Good heavens, I, 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 don't even, I don't even know how to, to formulate my thoughts here into words when it comes to this. 
the idea that the Holy Spirit would ask us to have the same mind as Christ when he was facing the cross is to me, folks, pretty astounding. Okay? The question then becomes, how do we do that? Without diminishing what he did. Making, uh, making light of what he did. How do we do that? And why should we do that? But why is it necessary that we have the, the same mind, that we have, it's the same mind in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, okay? When it comes to humbling ourselves and becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The one thing that Christ came to do was die. He was born to die. There was no shrinking away from his responsibility, his, his, his obligation, as far as he obligated himself, okay? It wasn't mandated that he die. He didn't, the father didn't, didn't, didn't. Yes, he did give his son for the purpose of dying, but it was Christ Jesus, folks, who willingly gave his life in your place, willingly dismissed his spirit, God Almighty, God of very God, the one who hung the stars in the sky. He didn't need permission from the Father to give his life. He willingly gave his life. He didn't have to, but he did. There's nothing that obligated him to. He willingly gave his life in your place as your substitutionary uh, your kinsman redeemer. We're going to pick up more on this in the in the next following video. I think you're going to find this. Uh, if I, I would hope that you would find it a little more than interesting. If, dearly beloved, we're looking at a passage of scripture in Philippians in, in which, if we went down and we did it, and this is probably what I should do in the next video, is kind of review where we've been, what's what's brought us up to this point. There's there's something that I want you to see here that is so profound I hardly I hardly know how to even put it into words. We certainly don't want to make the wrong judgments concerning this passage of scripture. It's too sacred a passage of scripture. It's not saying that any other passage of scripture is any less sacred. I'm just saying that this particular passage of scripture really it hits a nerve because we are talking about not only the, the the precious death life and death of our lord jesus christ in our place but we're talking about our being asked to have that same mind in us okay that he had and we know or we should know it should even go without saying what that cross is going to mean in our lives. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you all once again for all of your comments. I so love and, and am encu I'm encouraged by the comments that you leave. Until next time, thanks for watching.